This is Bolana Putz with Laylee, and I'm happy and thankful to be joined today with Jeremy Schmidt, dairy producer there in the heart of Wisconsin. And we're going to talk over a cup of coffee today about a couple subjects. Jeremy's family farm transitioned to robots nearly uh, two years ago. And today we're going to talk about three subjects. We're going to go over uh, somatic cell counts. We're gonna talk about how many cows had to make career changes because they went from the parlor into the robot barn. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about herd health and people and what, what their labor situation looks like there. So that's a lot to unpack over one cup of coffee, Jeremy. So let's just get right into it and talk about somatic cell counts. What are you seeing uh, and how does that robot help you with your mastitis cases? Well, last month and so far this month, we are running a 60,000 somatic cell, which is pretty low. Um, we have all 12 robots are fitted with the MQCC, which is the Laley somatic cell counter. Every cow is sampled every third milking unless they are 500,000 somatic cell count or higher than they're sampled every milking until they go below that threshold. And I believe that could be adjusted however you want, whatever farm or however you feel like doing it. So um, with that, every day we're looking at those reports and where any cows that show up over 500,000, we're going and running a CMT paddle on them. And if they come up with a high quarter, we run our own milk cultures and then we take action based on those results. Um, the other thing that's allowing us to do is uh, with our routing and our sort pens, we have the ability to put a cow in a sort pen and she has access to the one robot that has a second milk line. And so we can designate cows with high semantic cell counts to go to our milk pasteurizer for our calves. So that helps us control our somatic cell count on the milk we're shipping and keep it low. And where we ship our milk, they give a good premiums for things like that. And then the other thing is uh, in our old facility, we dealt with a fair amount of contagious mastitis. And I've basically been able to all but eliminate that. Fantastic. So you mentioned, uh you, where your milk's getting processed and, and that's all going into Satori cheeses, which has very high quality milk standards. Um, and you were previously milking in the parlor. What are some of the differences you see in this robot herd? Well, back to the contagious mastitis. I mean, that's the, been the biggest one there. And I think a lot of it goes back to the basics of robots. Things like quarter milking, uh, consistent prep routine, some of the things you struggle with maybe with having different employees on different shifts in a parlor. Um, really those basics. Uh, another one is not going to a holding area and waiting for up to an hour to get milked. I think that can be a very stressful thing on a cow versus what they have now, which is free flow, access to do whatever they want, go get milked whenever they want, and they can complete their whole get milked, drink water, eat and lay down in 20 minutes if they want, and do it when they want. So those are the big things. Oh, pellet feeding too. I mean, we've been able to maintain good consistent components throughout the year. I mean, obviously I have a new barn, so environments better than maybe what it was which helps with that but being able to target feed the right cow at the right stage of lactation with the pellets helps with consistent and good components so tell us a little bit more about your barn um, you were in i think water beds previously you changed your bedding uh, what are you seeing with your bedding choice and their feet and legs yeah, not even water beds. It was just a rubber mat with some foam underneath. So, okay. um, a lot more cows. I mean, when, when I have to walk through with the nutritionist, other people, other consultants, they always comment how well the cows are laying down. So 
we're at, we're on recycled sand. Every year, well, Sartori's in the farm program, so it's an animal welfare audit. And every other year, we do a walkthrough, which we're due, I believe, in March this year. And we used to, our only real ding against us was hawks on cows. Maybe not blown up, but they would have the hair rubbed off or something like that. And I expect on this next welfare audit for that to be pretty much non-existent. I just don't see it anymore. Um, so it's a, coming out of the sand separator, it's very, fairly coarse sand. So kind of rocky, but that also means good drainage. So you don't have any puddling in the stalls, which helps with, with milk quality. Um, when we first switched to that, our cows had never seen sand before. So they were going to go from no sand to this coarse sand. And a lot of my Dalton's and I guess I was worried about it too. I didn't know how the hooves would hold up, but they have done fine. Um, it's helped with my color rate, cow longevity, uh, heat detection. I mean, cows have better traction now, so they show better heat detection. So repros better. I mean, just across the board, everything been an improvement. Awesome. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about your cull rate because uh, I was lucky. I got to go to your farm here recently and you were actually getting ready to sort off a group of heifers um, because your numbers were a little bit different than what you anticipated. And um, I think I think there's a lot of robot farmers that make the switch and think, gosh, I'm going to have to cull a lot of cows because they're just not going to be robot ready. Tell us, tell us what happened when you went, when you made that change, did you have to have cows quote, make career changes? And what is your cow heifer inventory looking like? Yeah, leading up to the project, I mean, probably for a good two or three years before we were going to start up, I'd planned for 20% thinking I was going to be eliminating 20% of my herd just because they wouldn't work in the robots. So at one point I was running like low to almost 45%. So low 40s to 45% first lactation heifers in my herd, which that's just too high. You want cows to last. Older cows make more milk. And we all know that. Um, and now that we're like, I think we're 19 months into this or 20 months into this, things are really starting to get consistent to the point where I've been able to reduce my color rate by 15%. Um, so I can really dial in my breeding program. I know I need this amount of heifers fresh in each month to maintain my color rate. And um, so then I'm raising less heifers. That's less feed, that's less labor. It just uh, all works out. Um, kind of going back to the semantic cell and the staff or the well, staff aureus thing. In the old facility, my 17% of my call rate was for contagious mastitis over a year. That, that's high and that's almost non existent. I mean, a good example was we used to milk test every month and I had, we'd have 50 to 70 cows on that day have a somatic cell of 500 or more. So then we would go and sample them and I'd probably get six to 10 that would come back positive and I would ship them right away. Now I don't have that. So that's that many more cows every month. I'm not getting rid of for that reason. I can call for low milk production or maybe they're really long, slow milkers and they have long robot times, box times. So things like that, I've been able to call cows for the right reasons rather than being forced to. Right, right. And you said it yourself, older cows are more milk. So maybe getting another lactation out of these cows, uh, even better. So finally, cool. <laughs> let's talk about um, the people there at the dairy. What changes have you seen in the skill sets? What changes have you seen in the numbers of people? Help us understand what your labor situation looks like there at Hickory. Sure. Um, in the old facility, we only milked twice a day, so I didn't have an abundance of, I think I had six employees that were milkers. And when we moved down, we didn't fire anybody. Um, 
as we got into the barn and we got more consist, we got more settled in with our routines. Well, some people would quit and leave for whatever reason, and we just realized we didn't need to replace them. And I'd say we're we're down four or five full time employees usually from where we were, and that's about where we want to be. Um, and then differences with employees, we had employees step up, and you have to be have a diverse skill set. So we've had a few of them, for example, just milk cows before. Well, now they're taking care of fresh cows, they're doing maintenance, they're helping in the calf barn, and they're even driving tractors, doing field work. You have to be diverse, and I think they enjoy that too, rather than doing eight straight hours in the parlor every day and never changes. Now you can kind of change things up and it makes their day more enjoyable. Um, so that's been the biggest difference. Uh, on my end of things, you got to keep Robots are, they're high maintenance. You gotta stay on top of it. You can kind of let a parlor get out of whack or be a little neglected and you don't really notice it, but robots take more maintenance, but that's just part of it. So maybe my job has changed a little bit that way, but I enjoy that part too. Great, great. Well, thanks again for taking some time to give us uh, an overview and a real quick brief highlights of what's happening at your dairy when it comes to people, somatic cell, cow herd, uh, longevity in that herd. I'm really excited to see the changes in the almost two years for Hickory Lawn and we appreciate your business. So for those of you out there that have more questions about robotic dairies, uh, find your local Laley Center at laley.com. And if you wanna hear more from producers like Jeremy, be sure to sign up at coffeetalks.laleylife.com. Thanks again, Jeremy, and stay warm this winter. Thank you.